Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. Imagine that you're playing a video game on your computer, your Xbox, or your PlayStation. You know, the type, one of those medieval quest kind of games. So embarking on this grand adventure, as you begin the game, your character is armed with magical powers and various weapons bestowed upon you by various authorities. But at the beginning of the game, of course, your character is weak. More power, better weapons will be needed for you to win the game. Never fear, however. Assistance to help you win the game will be provided as your mission progresses. What's the goal of the game? Well, it's to battle your way to the tops of seven mountains, conquering each one in turn. The game is very, very difficult. Not every character completes the mission and may only conquer one or two of the seven mountains. Now, keep in mind that very few players ever make it to the end of the game and win, subduing all seven, but there are a few great players from the past who did, in fact, achieve this seemingly impossible goal. Let those great warriors inspire you in the quest to conquer the seven mountains. Winning the game is indeed possible with a lot of help, which fortunately you'll receive as the game goes on. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. So what's the objective of the game? Well, as I say, it's to conquer the various mountains. It can be accomplished by battling your way through the forces of evil that guard the gates at the base of each mountain. You'll win by using your supernatural weapons to tear down those gates and batter down the strongholds of the enemy. You must defeat the evil forces currently occupying that mountain. As you progress up the mountain, fighting increasingly difficult battles with the demonic hordes, the ultimate aim is to conquer the mountain by unseating the demonic lord that currently sits atop that particular mountain. This is a very difficult mission. The good news is, is that you're not going it alone. This is not a single player game. To assist you in your seemingly impossible quest, you must know that this is a worldwide multiplayer game with other characters online fighting alongside you. Moreover, as in every great quest game, your character needs an infusion of money in order to keep your quest going. But don't worry. As you progress, there will be a massive transfer of wealth from worldly kingdoms. Their money will become yours as you succeed in your quest. Along your journey, you will discover hidden benefits that will help your character and assist you to win the game. You can, for example, visit the graves of long-dead warriors from the past, which will impart supernatural powers to aid you in fighting the demons on the mountains. Scattered around the world of the game are hidden treasures, too. Ancient spells and prayers left behind by the great warriors of the past who did conquer the various mountains. As you discover these weapons, they will empower and assist you to be able to defeat the demonic forces and conquer the seven mountains. Now, does that sound like a fun quest-type video game? Well, in reality, it's not a video game. It's a description of the goal of what is termed the Seven Mountains Mandate version of Dominion Theology. But if it all starts to sound more and more like a video game, we need to take a closer look at the distinctives of the movement. What exactly are the theological and biblical underpinnings of not just Dominion theology as a whole, but specifically the Seven Mountains Mandate Dominion theology? Welcome to this bonus edition of Mind Shift Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Clint Haycock. I'm going to help you understand and unpack not just Dominion theology as a whole, but specifically this stream or version of it, which is called the Seven Mountains Mandate Dominion Theology. And that's what we're going to do in this special bonus episode. Let's take a look at 
the differences between the various streams. Now, although it's very, very difficult to unpack the sort of streams or traditions within Dominionism as a whole, one helpful way that I've been able to sort of understand it is what they call the differences between hard and soft Dominion theologies. Okay, so think of it in terms of a spectrum. These these kind of all come out of the same initial river, if you will, but they've broken off into smaller streams, but they all have things in common. Let's take a look at hard Dominion theology first. You could say that's on the extreme end of the spectrum. Now, although there's some significant differences between what's been termed hard and soft versions of Dominion theology, they all agree on a great many theological and biblical aspects. Now, we can look at it, as I say, in terms of a spectrum. Now, hard Dominion theology, that's associated with Christian Reconstructionism. Together with one of the major founders of the movement, one R.J. Rushdooney, who wrote a book called The Institute of Biblical Laws back in the early 1970s. So they're operating from within a very largely deterministic Calvinist theological perspective. Christian Reconstructionism emphasizes more of the sovereignty of God in accomplishing his kingdom mission. The major tenet of Christian Reconstructionism is the belief that particularly American civil society, because of course that's the context in which Rush Dooney was working, he believed that American civil society should essentially become a theocracy founded upon God's Old Testament laws. And this is known, a technical term is theonomy. But in order to accomplish his vision, Rush Dooney argued that it should be more of a grassroots movement. And that helps to explain why he, for example, emphasized Christian homeschooling. He was one of the major proponents and the early founders of the Christian homeschooling movement. Steeped in a, quote, biblical worldview within their homeschooling experience, shielded from the evil influences of the world, these children would ultimately leave home and their influence as Christians would eventually permeate all of society, every aspect, every layer. But in the end, Christian Reconstructionism still advocates the notion that's near and dear to virtually every stream of Dominion theology, and that is this, that Christians should be in charge of every aspect of society. What makes hard Dominion theology so extreme is Rush Dooney's application of Old Testament biblical law to society, its civil laws. In his view, this would include capital punishment, such as public stoning or other brutal forms of execution for all sorts of sins and crimes outlined in the Mosaic Law. And these would include things like adultery, homosexuality, rape, etc. Further, Christian Reconstruction scholars who've taken Rush Dooney's work forward include his son, one Mark Rush Dooney, who has carried on as the head of the Chalcedon or the Chalcedon Foundation that his late father started. Additionally, Gary North, Here's another major player in the Christian Reconstructionist field. And really, it was North and R.J. Rush Dooney. Both men's work has been really disproportionately influential, particularly among the Christian right, as you see them infiltrating politics, particularly in the Trump administration. Now, even though most evangelicals today have never even heard of Rush Dooney or Gary North, a great many of the Christian Reconstruction talking points have permeated the language of mainstream evangelicalism. For example, one Christian Reconstruction concept is the notion that American judges should operate from within a biblical worldview, which, for example, is the view taken by former Trump acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker. He said that in a speech. He also held, Whitaker said, that no federal judge should be appointed to the bench who did not espouse such a worldview. And that's a Christian Reconstructionist talking point. Another myth promulgated by Christian Reconstructionism is the notion that America's legal system was initially founded upon either biblical law in general or specifically on the Ten Commandments. This may explain in part why there have been so many legal battles over public displays of the commandments in American courts. In other words, what possible reason would there be to display the Ten Commandments in a court of law if, in fact, American law was not somehow connected back to the Ten Commandments? It's a very public, a very demonstrable link between the two legal systems, the Old Testament and modern American law. 
and it makes a powerful statement to the effect that American law is somehow tied to biblical law and that the founding fathers intended it to be such. So in terms of its influence on the intersection of conservative Christians and politics, Christian Reconstructionism provides many of the ideological, theological, philosophical, and biblical justification underpinning much of the movement in the Christian right. And again, many involved in the Christian right, or as I say, mainstream evangelicalism, may have never even heard the names of Gary North or Rush Dooney, or wouldn't admit that they've ever read them. One hears many Christian Reconstructionist talking points espoused by the Christian right. Once you start to know what these points are, when you start doing your research, you'll uncover them among the Christian right. Another major player in the Christian Reconstructionist movement is Dr. J. Grimstead. Now, he was a close associate or disciple mentored by Rush Dooney. He went on to found the Coalition on Revival. Now, the COR, the Coalition on Revival, what they tried to do was they tried to bring the more academic and, of course, admittedly extreme aspects of Rush Dooney's work into the mainstream. What the COR was trying to do was they were trying to tie both conservatives and charismatics together in one movement. And, of course, if you know anything about Christian theology, you know that conservatives and charismatics normally would not go along together. Fundamentalists don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and charismatics, of course, do. They're into tongues and prophecies and miracles and healings and all the rest of it. But the COR was critical because he was trying to bring those two together. Now, there was an academic side of Christian Reconstructionism, but the work is very dense. It's hard to read. It didn't gain much traction in the mainstream evangelical world. It's not aimed at a populist level. But the charismatic arm of the church, on the other hand, had much more of a draw. So Grimstead, through the work of the COR, what he did was he brought a more populist message to Christian Reconstructionism by putting forth 17 biblical worldview position papers. And what these papers do is they articulate their vision for Christian dominionism over every aspect of society. And you can look this up on Reformation.net. That is the website of the Coalition on Revival. So that's kind of an overview of hard dominion theology, Uh, and Christian Reconstructionism, how it works together. Let's take a look at soft dominion theology now on the other end of the spectrum. Now, soft dominion theology would be more where the Seven Mountains Mandate version of dominion theology would be located. Let's take a minute and just have a brief aside. Where did this idea of the Seven Mountains Mandate come from? Well, I'm taking a look at the generals.org website. That is the kind of home network of the generals, which is Cindy Jacobs. We'll talk a little bit more about her later on. But according to their own website, this is the official story of where this idea came from. And it says under the heading, The Seven Mountains of Societal Influence, quote, In 1975, Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade, and Lauren Cunningham, founder of Youth with a Mission, YWAM, developed a God-given, world-changing strategy. Their mandate, bring godly change to a nation by reaching its seven spheres or mountains of societal influence, end quote. Now, that is the official storyline, the official narrative of how this Seven Mountains mandate supposedly came about. Lauren Cunningham and Bill Bright allegedly each individually arrived at this revelation, independent of each other, came together, and wow, they decided that this thing was called the Seven Mountains Cultural Mandate. So they trace in their own history back to the early 1970s. So that's how long at least this movement has been around, and it's just been codified and developed even further in the decades since. But even though there are some pretty major differences between hard and soft dominion theology, in the main, though, even the soft dominionist side, the Seven Mountain side, they would agree with the Christian Reconstructionist side of the spectrum that Christians should, and in some cases even must, occupy major positions of influence in society. And that's one of the major agreement points on all the spectrum of dominion theology. And the reason that that is important is that some in the traditions of dominion theology will say that Christ cannot return or that he will not return until Christians are, in fact, ruling in every sector or sphere of society. That's a critical point to make. But when we compare the differences between hard and soft, 
According to this view, the soft dominion theology, or the seven mountain side, believers should infiltrate and ultimately occupy key positions of societal power and influence. Where hard and soft dominion theology differ is that seven mountains mandate is more about infiltration rather than a more hostile takeover or the imposition of a theocracy, which a lot of the Christian Reconstructionism, even though it was a grassroots movement, their vision ultimately was a pretty tough, extreme view at the end of the day. The end goal may be the same or even similar, but the strategy of how it's done differs greatly between hard and soft dominion theology. Seven Mountains Mandate operates more from an Arminian theological perspective as compared to the Calvinism of Christian Reconstructionism. They view their mandate as something that the individual believer must work toward in partnership with God rather than, as the Reconstructionists did, rather than relying mostly on the sovereignty of God. And in Calvinism, it's all about the sovereignty of God. So there's a major theological difference there. So Seven Mountains Dominion theologians, they're willing to work within the existing structures of American society, but nonetheless, their overriding vision is to see Christians occupying the seven cultural mountains, or they sometimes use the word pillars or spheres of influence, right across society. Okay, what are these seven mountains? In no particular order, here are the seven mountains. Government, arts and entertainment, media, education, religion, business, and family. And of course, they believe that the church is... Uh, in charge of the religion mountain, but the other six are where we need to infiltrate and ultimately occupy. Now, standing in their way of occupying the seven mountains, just like our video game, are the various territorial demons, and they are ruling over nations, cities, regions, whatever. Atop each of the mountains sits a demonic ruler under the auspices, ultimately, of Satan, who is the god of this world, And each of these must be battled and ultimately displaced by utilizing spiritual warfare and the authority bestowed upon the individual believer by an apostolic authority. And that is why you see things like apostolic prayer networks in a state or in a region. That's why they believe it's so important. You can't just go out and battle these demons under your own steam, as it were. You need the authority of of a recognized apostle to give you the authority to battle those demons, tear down the strongholds, and conquer the mountain, just like in that video game. But if you stop and think about it, what they're actually saying, their theology, is that secular institutions like education, government, media, arts and entertainment, are actually right now under the power of Satan and his demonic forces. I heard a podcast by Johnny Enloe, and I'll talk a bit more about this later on, where he talks about, for example, the mountain of education. And he says that great institutions of learning like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, these are so influential because they're secular universities and they have so many students coming not just from all over America, but all over the world. And they are secular institutions. But because they are not being run by Christians, now stop and think about that. That means they are under the authority, the dominion of Satan. That is literally what this, the implications of this view are. Government, media, education, other mountains are under the power, the influence of Satan and his demons. So if you take that view to its logical conclusion, where do you end up in this view? It's not just a sort of abstraction we're talking about here. This is real stuff, what they actually believe. And therefore, if you're involved in any of those areas of societal influence and you're not a Christian, you're under the power of the control of Satan. It's literally demonizing people, demonizing institutions. And that's really the implication of a view like Seven Mountains Mandate Dominion Theology. All right, so let's take a look at some of the actual biblical and theological distinctives. Now, some of these are generally related to Dominion Theology as a whole, but ultimately we're going to start getting more into the Seven Mountains Mandate, the the real distinctives behind that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through these in the order that kind of makes sense to me. I have kind of systematized it in order to explain it as it sort of unfolds. You need to understand it how it how the theology develops. So let's start with number 1. Satan, originally Lucifer, who was an angel of God, he was a good angel. 
He'd already fallen. He had been cast down from heaven before God created the earth. Now, that's important in the timeline of dominion theology because when Satan shows up in the guise of the serpent in Genesis chapter 3 to tempt Adam and Eve, he was already seeking to have dominion over the earth. You see that? He was cast out of heaven for wanting the same kind of thing. And this desire to usurp God's own authority and his kingship, God's own dominion, was what originally cost Lucifer his exalted status in heaven. Now, just keep that, park that thought in mind. Number two, let's look at this one. God created the earth as an exact copy of heaven. Now, why is that significant? This is significant for the following reasons. Uh, Because first of all, God's governance of heaven should be mirrored on earth. And one of their favorite verses is what Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer. He said, your, speaking to God, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, dominionists believe, they say, this is not some sort of pious wish on the part of Jesus. It's actually an imperative. It's a command. In other words, what Jesus was saying is, in effect, just in the same way that God runs heaven, his governance of heaven, in the same way believers should run the earth and rule the earth. This was God's original intention for humanity before creation, and that was for us to have dominion, just like he has in heaven. Now, another reason why this idea that God is creating earth with an exact mirrored copy of what's going on in heaven is that worship and prayer on earth should also mirror the heavenly worship of God, which is currently going on within the heavenly throne room. And that'll explain movements like IHOP Kansas City, Bethel Redding, the Fredericksburg Prayer Furnace, Awaken the Dawn, or the Awaken 2020 movement. What they're actually doing, if you do your research, They'll say it. We are seeking to replicate on earth what we believe is currently happening right now in heaven, the worship of God. And so that's a very critical distinctive. All right, so back to our timeline. Satan has already fallen. God creates, or his desire in creating earth was to um, mirror or mimic the exact representation of what was going on in heaven. So number three, Adam and Eve, when they were created by God, originally had dominion over all the earth. And that's mandated by the authority of God. And their classic text is Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And this, of course, is the text in Genesis where God tells Adam and Eve to rule over the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over it. And that's really where this idea of dominion theology originates. Virtually all dominionists from soft to hard, they all agree on the fact that Adam and Eve were assigned dominion over all the earth by God right in the beginning. And that was God's design. Point number four then, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, when they ate the forbidden fruit, what happens? They lost their God-given dominion to Satan. All dominionists agree on this point also. They were given dominion. When they sinned, they lost the dominion that had, that had been assigned to them by God. I need to pause here just for a minute to make a very crucial distinction. This is a really crucial point. One of the distinctions that I have uncovered in the difference between hard and soft dominion theology, or as I've been saying, Christian Reconstructionism on the one hand and the Seven Mountains Dominion Theology on the other. The difference is when we look at the question, how does humanity regain its dominion that was lost in the garden when Adam and Eve fell, you find that the two different traditions have completely different answers to that question. For Rush Dooney and the Christian Reconstructionist, the answer to the question is God's law. In other words, God gave the law first to Moses and then the nation of Israel as the primary means by which Israel was supposed to establish dominion on earth. It was through the application of the law of God. Now, Rushduni argues that Israel failed in that, and therefore they have been set aside. Now it's up to the church. And he says it's different administration of the application of how God is intending to bring about his plan to restore dominion to humanity, but the law is still binding. And that is a critical distinction. So for Rushduni, the law was God's means by which he was going to allow humanity to regain dominion 
the dominion that Adam and Eve lost. Now, when you look at Seven Mountains, as we've been talking about, now we're in the realm of this video game. It's not about the reconstruction of society according to biblical law. For them, it's all about taking dominion by, as we've been saying, occupying those various mountains, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, kicking out the demonic forces that are occupying the mountains currently, engaging in spiritual warfare, and on and on and on. So you see, there's a major distinction between Christian Reconstructionism and Seven Mountains Dominion Theology. They both agree that humanity lost dominion and it needs to be regained, and that Christians should be ruling and running the world, and that is effectively how they think they're going to bring about God's kingdom here on earth. But the means by which that is done are vastly different, and yet both of them agree that ultimately Christians should be ruling. All right, let's get back to our development of Seven Mountains systematic theology. I guess you could call it for lack of a better word. I was talking about how Adam and Eve fell in the garden by eating of the forbidden fruit. What happened? Well, point number five is this. Satan usurped then, at that point, their God-given dominion. And since that time, he has become the God of this world. And that's an actual phrase from the New Testament. So in their view, once Satan usurped the dominion originally granted Adam and Eve, Satan and his demons now occupy the various mountains of societal influence over all the nations of the world. And this is now getting into specifically, obviously, the Seven Mountains mandate stream, if you will, of Dominion theology. So who are the major players? Who are the major key figures in Seven Mountains Dominion theology? And we see that it's got an overlap into the New Apostolic Reformation churches as well. One of the key figures that you're going to come across is a guy named Dr. C. Peter Wagner, who was the one who coined the term New Apostolic Reformation. He was a prolific author. He wrote over 70 books. He died, I think, in 2016. But he was one of the main key leaders. Other people, Dr. Lance Walnow, Cindy Jacobs, who I think I've mentioned. And now we're going to look at some of the teachings specifically of a guy named Johnny Enlow. He's one of the major figures, even though a lot of people have never heard of him. I'm going to pick up some of his specific teachings as I've been listening to him unpacking this on his Restore 7 podcast as he goes through the Seven Mountains mandate in these sort of one-hour sessions on the podcast. And what he'll do is he'll cite verses in Revelation. You know, the, the whore of Babylon sits on the seven mountains, and this proves that Satan is now sitting on top of all these seven cultural mountains. Now, that makes you wonder, if he's sitting on all seven mountains, that's got to include the religion mountain over which the church allegedly has dominion. So, what is that about? Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in more detail in a minute. So, number six, then, the task of the Christian is to take dominion over these various cultural mountains, those seven mountains. Going back to the garden, Adam and Eve's original task was to kick the devil off this world, at which, of course, they failed and they lost their dominion and now usurped by Satan. It's now up to the church to accomplish the original mandate given to them by God, the one that they lost in the garden. Dominionists agree that, yes, one task of the church is to evangelize the world and provide social outreach and so forth. That's sort of the classical view of being missional. But they all say this is but one small aspect of the church. When they use the words discipling the nations, according to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, what it's really about, discipling, is actually about taking dominion over the world. Transforming nations is a key phrase that they'll use. Taking cities for God, etc. You'll hear those kind of phrases being used, and that's what they mean. They're not talking about just witnessing to an individual person to help them become a Christian, although that's a, a small part of it. What they're actually looking at is discipleship equals taking dominion. Now, what about biblical examples? Point number seven, they point to biblical examples of what successful taking dominion looks like. And they would point to, for example, characters like Joseph in the book of Genesis and Esther in the book of Esther. So both characters, what they were doing, they were struggling to survive in a foreign land. Joseph was in Egypt. Esther was part of the Jewish captivity in Persia. But miraculously, with God's help, of course, Each successfully climbed the mountain in front of them. And they point to Joseph. Look at him. He was a slave in Egypt. He ended up on top of the mountain. You know, economy, government, media. He was able to broadcast his message to all of 
uh, Egypt and indeed the world during the time of famine. And of course, they would point to Esther. She's in Persia. She is nothing but a lowly Jewish woman. She gets elevated all the way to become the queen of the nation. So she's atop the government mountain. And of course, Esther is able to save the Jewish people from her lofty position atop the government mountain. Joseph, of course, saved not just his own people of Israel, but all the nation of Egypt by stockpiling the food. So the, they would point to examples like that and say, yes, they, they did amazing things from their position of influence with God's power. And there's this other thing I wanted to pick up on too, and that's this transfer of wealth. I mentioned that when I was describing the video game. This is something that C. Peter Wagner talked about a lot. He said that at some point there's going to be this transfer of wealth from the nations, the secular nations, to Christians, and that's going to give them the funding the money that they need to implement the kingdom of God. And these are examples that they would point to from the Bible. And and they'd say, look, the money that was part of the Egyptian empire or the Persian empire was transferred to people like Joseph and Esther. And then they used their wealth to influence society for the better and do amazing things for God. You know, and so these are examples in the Dominionist or the Seven Mountains Dominion theology. They provide a model of what believers should be about today, and that is about occupying positions of influence in society. You can get to the top of the mountain or or multiple mountains, but it has to be with God's help. Now, there's another biblical warrant here, point number eight, the book of Joshua. Here's another one that they point to. They'll say, this provides a template of what taking dominion over the seven cultural mountains looks like. And again, going back to Johnny Enlow, as he lays it out, according to the book of Joshua, when Joshua and the Israelites entered the promised land of Canaan, if you remember the story, coming off the back of the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is dead, Joshua now becomes the leader, and they enter the land of Canaan. There were foreign nations in that land, and specifically Enlow picks up, he says there were seven foreign nations that God mandated them to dispossess. And we see this really clearly in Enlo, but I've seen this in other Seven Mountains Dominionist theology. Now, interestingly, here's an interesting side note. They make no mention of the fact that God commanded Israel to commit multiple acts of genocide in order to carry out this mandate. So that's a Uh, kind of a convenient thing they overlook. But anyway, what they say is the names of each of the nations, these seven nations, they're interpreted literally according to their reading of the Hebrew. And then they go from that and say, well, each one of these represents a spirit of something, like a spirit of poverty on the mountain of economy, you know? And so they'll say each one kind of serves as a type. Each foreign nation serves as a type, which then allegorically represents each one of the seven cultural mountains over which territorial demonic forces rule. And so Enlo will say that uh, over the nation of the Girgashites, that stands for the government, you know, and he relates that to a demonic entity uh, ruling over the government mountain. And this is a, a quote from one of Johnny Enlo's books. He says, quote, the name, and he's talking about the Girgashites, which was one of the nations living in the land, means, he says, dwelling in clayey soil and represents being motivated by earthly desires and ambitions. In essence, it represents a corruption brought on by the pride of life. The definition of corruption is the impairment of integrity, virtue, or morality. This is what presently rules in politics and government, end quote. So you can see what Enlo's doing. He's taken the name of a nation that Israel was supposed to dispossess. He's turned it into a type and then allegorized it and then spiritualized it and says... Right now in our government, there's all this corruption and so forth, and we've got to displace those demonic powers with good Christian rule. And of course, it's ironic that so many of these guys are Trump supporters, and he is one of the most uh, corrupt individuals, and yet they'll point to him and say, he's a Christian, he's supporting religious freedom. But anyway, that's another aside. Number nine, in order to accomplish the taking of each cultural mountain, the demonic forces that currently occupy these mountains must be displaced. And that's kind of an obvious thing, isn't it? That there's a demonic force sitting atop these mountains. You've got to kick them off the mountains and the Christians have to take over. So point number 10, 
Satan and his demons, as we've mentioned already, they're currently in charge of the seven mountains of societal influence. So again, going back to a guy like Johnny Enlow, he reads the typology of Revelation, the whore of Babylon who sits on the seven hills that relates to Satan's current dominion over the seven mountains. Now, again, this is interesting because, as I said, they hold that the church has always had dominion over the religion mountain. So is Satan in charge of that too? And this is an interesting question. How do these demonic forces come to occupy each mountain? Now, according to spiritual mapping, this is a belief within uh, dominion theology. What they say is that civilizations in the past have literally rejected God in favor of Satan. They've, they've worshipped false gods, false religions. They've got false religious festivals, etc. And they say that these activities, they actually give demons the legal right to establish dominion over these various cultural mountains within their society. And so what they'll say is, hey, these nations have set out the welcome mat for these demonic forces in the past, thus giving them the legal authority to occupy those particular mountains. And so that's how come they got to be in those, on top of those mountains. And now, regardless of the city or the nation or wherever you find yourself, you've got to battle those demonic forces, kick them off that mountain in order to take dominion over it. But there's good news. Just like our video game, point num number 11 is that Christ, by the virtue of his sacrifice on the cross, now extends all authority to the church to make disciples. As I've said before, that by which they mean, yes, it's about preaching the gospel, but they think that's too small of a vision. Taking dominion by virtue of this transferred authority is what the church is really to be about today. And they will say that Christ has been granted legal authority uh, uh, to, to, to the church to make disciples. And that's what they mean, a code word for uh, establishing dominion. So point number 12, the uh, apostolic authority, or what they call a mantle, like a prophetic mantle that was passed from down the generations from prophet to prophet, that is what is needed in order to carry out that seven mountains mandate. And as I said before, that's part of what they, in churches you'll see within the new apostolic movement, and the key word there is apostolic. They believe that the offices of prophet and apostle, from the text of Ephesians 5, they've been lacking in the church. They've been ignored or overlooked for millennia. Now, in this third wave of the Spirit, these two offices are being restored. And that's why you'll see, particularly in the New Apostolic Reformation churches like Bethel, Reading, IHOP, KC, H Rock Church, and, and places like that. That's why there's such an emphasis on the prophetic, as well as this apostolic authority, apostolic prayer networks, etc., etc. So, point number thirteen: believers engage in spiritual warfare when they attempt to infiltrate and occupy the various mountains, just like the video game. Thus, there's a need for activities such as spiritual mapping. And the reason you have to do spiritual mapping is you've got to find out specifically which demonic forces have dominion over a city, a region, a nation, etc. And they call this the strong man, you know, who rules over a region or the nation or a city. And the goal is that Christians have to tear down the enemy's strongholds. They've got to take control over the gates of a city or a region. And you hear those kind of things, gatekeepers and tearing down gates and battering down strongholds in their prayers. And they'll have with, with the apostolic authority, they'll be able to control what goes in and what comes out of a city or a region or a nation once the gates are taken. This is sort of the strategic level element of Seven Mountains Dominion Theology. And they'll also say, look, the gatekeepers, that's a position of influence. You look at the Old Testament in Israel, and they'll say, look, the elders of the city would sit at the gates, the city gates. They're, they're in a position of authority. They're in a position of prominence. They're wise people who are in charge of who comes in, who comes out. They're dispensing their wisdom. And that's how they see themselves, these apostles sitting at the gates, letting things go in and out or having control over a region. Now, when we look at the mountains, point number 14, what we see is there's some kind of development within that theology. In their view, mountains have low, middle, and high elements to them. In other words, as believers infiltrate and occupy the various mountains, okay, they might find themselves on a particular level, be it low, mid, or high in terms of their influence. For example, on the government mountain, 
a low-level position would be something like a chauffeur or a security guard of a politician, you know, a cook in the White House, something like that, someone who carries out low-level tasks. You go up the mountain a little bit higher, you're now in the mid-level, someone like on a city council or a mayor of a small town, someone who, who is an aide to a person on that sort of mid-level. And of course, finally, now when we get up to high levels, we're talking about positions like presidents, prime ministers, leaders of nations, or Congress people, senators, or aides or advisors to people in those very, very high top level positions. So you can see, and what they say is that no matter where you are on that particular mountain, whether it's the mountain of education or government or media and arts and entertainment or whatever, low, middle, or high, you have a corresponding level of influence on that. You got to be thinking in terms of this biblical worldview and you are taking dominion over your level to which you've been assigned. All right, so let's move on. Now, number 15, there's a lot of talk you hear about generations that God is allegedly raising up to accomplish some sort of supernatural purpose. They'll talk about things like the feet generation, as in, you know, God will make your enemies your footstool, your feet. You're one of the feet generation. You'll hear things like that. And that's why rallies like Awaken 2020, which is part of that Awaken the Dawn movement, there's a bunch of them coming up this year. And this is all about raising up a new generation to pass on the torch, to pass that mantle to. That's why they're so interested in uh, reaching out to younger people. You've got one coming up at the Sun Devil Stadium in Arizona featuring Kanye West, who is apparently now a Christian. And because of the draw of Kanye West, they're going to be bring it sold out. They sold the thing out in minutes. And yet the people who are actually speaking to that generation of younger millennials are known dominionists like Cindy Jacobs and some of these other ones. These guys are using people like Kanye West as, as their draw to get this new generation in. Now, there's a couple of other points that I picked up on. Number 16, dominionists, they'll believe that Christians, and specifically America, should support the nation of Israel. Now, that's a critical piece. And, and going on into Genesis 12, 1 through 3, what they do is they seize upon this notion as God told Abram, who later became Abraham, he says, any nation that blesses you, I will bless. Any nation that curses you, I will curse. Speaking of the nation of Israel. So not just America, but in fact, any nation that supports or doesn't support Israel will find themselves either being blessed by God or cursed by God. And of course, there's also a, an important element of end times prophecy included in this support for Israel. This is something you'll notice on virtually every single dominionist website, or they'll, they'll talk about this a lot. They fund trips to Israel. They take groups of people to Israel. A lot of them were present when D uh, Donald Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem a few years ago, that was a huge event in their view that, first of all, America is supporting Israel, and that secondly, it all somehow ties in with end times prophecy. The Messiah is going to rule from Israel, and it's important that America recognize Jerusalem as specifically a Jewish capital, and the other nations around, the Palestinians and some Arabs, were not at all happy about this, and there were massive protests because they felt like it was an outrage and a complete slap in the face. So support for Israel is absolutely huge. Now the final point is this, number 17, going along with this Israel connection, nations who support Israel, they say they're going to be seen as sheep nations, those who don't are what they call goat nations. And that's taken from Jesus' story or parable, whatever you want to call it. In the final day, God is judging between the sheep and the goats in Matthew 7. And what they do is they'll say, we're not just talking about, he wasn't just talking about individual people, some who get to go to heaven, some who have to go to hell. He, they're talking about, Jesus was talking about entire nations. You're either a sheep nation or a goat nation. And part of this, this talk of, discipling the nations and transforming the nations is about turning them from goat nations into sheep nations. And a big part of that is whether or not they support Israel. So that's a, an overview. There's more to it. I could go in more detail. But you know, this Dominion theology stuff, it's bizarre. It starts to sound like a video game. And I, the more I, I research it and the more I read about it, the more bizarre it gets and the more concerning it gets because specifically 
These guys are infiltrating, they have infiltrated the mountain of government. They're involved in the Trump White House right now. They have been virtually from the beginning, and they are increasing in their support for him. They're providing religious cover for him. And so this is a super huge concern because, especially in the Christian Reconstructionist side, you see a lot of the groups that are like the part of the Christian right as I was saying earlier, their ideology and philosophy, a lot of it's been informed by Christian Reconstructionism, this view that America was a Christian nation and it should become one again. And that's a very common talking point in Dominion theology. There's a lot of revisionist history, guys like David Barton from Wall Builders. And here's a guy who goes all over the country and he's all over Washington, D.C. He's a super popular speaker. He's on radio shows, podcasts, television, Christian broadcasting, giving his version of what he calls the forgotten history of America, which essentially is this idea that America was founded as a Christian nation and that the founding fathers we're all basically staunch Christians. They're like evangelicals of today in a way. But even though this myth has been completely disproven, and in fact, Andrew Seidel and I are going to talk about this next week in his book, The Myth of Christian Nationalism, he just goes through and debunks all that. It has not stopped guys like David Barton from spreading his stories, and it's being lapped up by all sorts of people in the evangelical world. But yet, these guys believe that in a lot of ways that America should be returning to this covenant status, and that part of that is establishing America the courts back into a biblical law scenario and that's where you see the influence of christian reconstructionism and so when you see a thing like you know a public battle over whether or not the ten commandments should be allowed to be displayed in an american court you see groups like the alliance defending freedom and other hard right christian legal arms that are d defending christians and evangelicals and, and judges and things who want to keep their monuments up in their courthouses. This is what these organizations like the ADF, that's what they're doing. They're, they're going to, to court to fight these uh, sort of battles for these people. People who, for example, don't want to uh, make a cake for a, a same-sex wedding. There's been a couple of high-profile cases, one in Washington State, another one, I think, in Colorado. And the ADF and organizations like that have gone to bat and they've defended these evangelicals who refuse to bake cakes for a gay wedding. You know, and that's what they're doing. And you'll see these things like these, a couple of years ago, we saw these super draconian anti-abortion laws being passed. And suddenly there was a spate of them in various states. Who's behind that? Organizations like Project Blitz, the Congressional Prayer Caucus. And you see they're, they're just blitzing American law, legal systems with all sorts of petitions for laws to be passed from something as simple as putting in God we trust on every state state license plate, uh, police cars, fire engines, that kind of thing, but also establishing biblical literacy programs in public schools, and on and on it goes. This is the aim of Project Blitz. And they're, they're saying, yes, and I know a lot of these are going to get batted down, but eventually we're going to clog up the courts with so many suits that they're, they're going to eventually go through. And of course, that explains why they are so happy with the fact that one of the things that Donald Trump is doing in delivering on his promises to his evangelical base is that he is appointing a record number of judges, many of whom are utterly unqualified. The only thing is they're qualified because they're evangelical Christians or they're super, super conservative. And so they're ecstatic that they're thinking with the appointment of Kavanaugh and Gorsuch to the Supreme Court, now we have a, a majority of conservative Supreme Court judges. And ultimately what's going to happen is they're looking to overturn Roe versus Wade. And they think now's our chance to do it. Eventually it's going to wind up before the Supreme Court. And the way they see it is those sort of laws, why are homosexuality and abortion such a big deal in the Christian right and in Dominion theology? Because it goes back to their view that America was a covenant nation and still is, just like the Old Testament nation of Israel, they had a covenant between themselves and Yahweh, God, and they say that the reason America is, was blessed so much in the past was because we were upholding our end of the covenant. We were being a Christian nation, but we've gotten away from all that. This is part of the revisionist history that people like Barton are always talking about. We've, we've strayed away from that. We've allowed things like abortion, same-sex marriage, all sorts of evils in our society, and that has resulted in God judging America. So they'll point to things like 9-11 or any sort of natural disaster, fires, floods, hurricanes, the fires in 
California and so forth, they'll say those are not just natural disasters. Those are actually the hand of God judging America. And the purpose of those judgments is to get our attention so that we'll repent as a nation corporately, we'll repent of all the sins that America is guilty of, and they'll cite verses like Second Chronicles 7.14, you know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Of course, there's no mention of the fact that that entire historical context was given to the nation of Israel during the time of the covenant, their theocratic relationship with God. That's conveniently overlooked in this scheme. But what is really significant to point out here is in that connection, citing verses like that, what they're doing is they're tying it in to their covenant theology and they're saying America has a covenant status just as ancient Israel did. And therefore, when America sins corporately by allowing sins like homosexuality, abortion, and so forth, we have to repent as a nation for those corporate sins and come back to this idea of being in a covenant relationship with God and uphold his laws. So you can see how a lot of this all ties together. All these various streams and talking points come out of reconstructionism and dominion theology. The average Christian may not understand, like I said before, who Rush Dooney was or who Gary North is or Johnny Enlow. They may have never heard of these people, but the talking points have filtered their way through into the mainstream church. And someone who will go, for example, to the rally in uh, at Sun Devil Stadium just to see Kanye West, they're going to get a huge dose of Seven Mountains Dominion Theology, even though they might just be going to a gig to see Kanye West and some other bands, they're going to get in, indoctrinated with Seven Mountains Theology. So that just shows you the reach and the scope of where this thing is going. I don't know where it's going to end up. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm glad to be getting the word out there to help educate people on what's going on and how this whole thing is playing out. And like I said, I'm not sure where it's all going to lead, but hopefully this has raised your awareness as well as some of the other podcasts I've done like, for example, with Andrew Seidel coming up, or the one I did last week with Dr. Andre Gagne from Concordia University in Montreal. This is something that should be of major concern, really, to anyone who's watching the news and seeing what's going on, particularly in the Trump White House, in the Trump administration, with the infiltration of the Christian right and these specific Dominion theologians. Okay, so I think that's as good a time as any to wrap it up. Thank you for sticking with me on this episode, this bonus episode, taking a look at specifically the theology behind Seven Mountains Dominion Theology. I hope that it's been beneficial and educational to you. If you have any thoughts, questions, comments on what I've been doing or this episode specifically, Drop me a DM on Twitter. You can follow me there at MindShift2018. You can also look up the MindShift Podcast Facebook page. Get a hold of me in a couple different ways on social media. I also wanted to give a shout out to all of our recent Patreon supporters. Thank you so much to Arte Soma, to Jane Little, Daniel Moore, J. Marie Wheaton, and Renee Lindemann for supporting this show on Patreon. If you want to be a supporter of MindShift Podcast, you can look me up on patreon.com forward slash mindship podcast and join our closed Facebook group and be a part of our Zoom calls. In fact, we're going to have one coming up next week on the 26th of January. Uh, it's our first MindShift Zoom call for 2020, and we have those every month for those who are in our closed group who are supporters of the show. So thank you once again for all your support. Looking forward to doing more stuff on Dominion Theology, reaching out to more people. Stay tuned next week for my episode coming up with Andrew Seidel uh, from the Freedom From Religion Foundation as we talk about his book on Christian nationalism and how that relates to this subject of Dominion Theology. So catch that one next Friday with myself and Andrew Seidel. I will see you again very soon right here on Mindshift Podcast. Podcast.